So I'd like to welcome everyone today to our second April meeting. Uh, we have two great speakers lined up, uh, Jimmy Moore and Denise Kirshner. And I hope we'll have a very lively uh, discussion after their presentations. As I need to remind you, the meeting is being live streamed uh, on YouTube, it's recorded, and those recordings will be made publicly available. As always, uh, Reinhardt and I are the co-leads of the working group, and we have Jim Sluka and uh, Bruce Shapiro uh, helping us in all sorts of interesting ways. And of course, you've heard from them before. We're always available to do our best to try to deal with any issues that you want to have addressed with the working group. You've seen this slide many times. The Slack channel, the Twitter, the iMag Wiki page only work if you contribute to them. Uh, please help us uh, make them lively and useful. Uh, and we do encourage people to visit our YouTube uh, channel and uh, reference that. Uh, we have a great archive of talks now and uh, I hope those are uh, useful to people and also can be distributed. Uh, so any ideas about how to make them more accessible and usable would be appreciated. Uh, are there any announcements that people would like to make uh, now that we have the short form announcements? Any uh, people are free to announce conferences, meetings, funding opportunities, requests for help, anything? Uh Okay, Jacob. So uh, I asked people from the uh, uh, working group, the, uh, the reproducibility and credibility working group and for the integration one, to look at their emails. There are several emails that are important that need some action from people. Please go and look at them and respond as quick as possible. Um, specifically, we have a representative from SISO, uh, Catherine, who is willing to give us a talk so please respond fondly to her. She's trying to help us. Right. I, I send her an email asking her to, if she would like to speak. Yes. Thank you very ah, much for that thank introduction. You. I'll follow up again. If I don't hear back, I will follow up again. Oh, you will. From Catherine, you will. Any other uh, announcements before we move on? Uh, James. Uh, T TJ, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm TJ Sego. I work at the Biocomplexity Institute at IU with James. Um, we are uh, looking for opportunities to uh, collaborate with um, clinicians and experimentalists um, on influenza infection and immune system modeling. Um, me and my collaborators with um, Erica Mochin, who's here today um, from Carlo, um, Bard, Herman Trout at Pitt, and then James as well. Um, we've developed uh, a multi-scale, multicellular spatial model of influenza infection and immune response um, that was derived from an ODE model uh, that Bart and Erica formulated um, and then calibrated um, to murine data of influenza infection. Um, it has lots of relevant biological object, objects and processes um, associated with the immune response. Um, so I'm interested in uh, discussing potential opportunities to couple um, computational modeling and simulation using this model um, with experimental work. Um, so if anyone would be interested in having such a conversation, um, you can contact me at uh, tjsego at iu.edu. I'll put that in the chat as well. And that's it. Thank you very much, James. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements, comments? Okay. It's the, 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 the comments and announcements section of the talk is new. So I guess it'll take us a few weeks to get used to having that opportunity. Thank you. Okay, uh, another reminder that one of the outputs on which we are judged are collaborations. And so if this working group has been useful to you in any way, uh, in particular, writing a paper with somebody, preparing a grant proposal with somebody, teaching and modeling resources, just as expensive discussions with people you might not have met otherwise, uh, please do let us know so that we can put that in the record and explain uh, and justify our existence. That would be very helpful. Uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, next week, we have uh, Winston Guerrera um, from South Africa. 
and Vivek Shenoy from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, April 22nd, we have Deborah Peters, uh, who's going to be talking about very multi-scale modeling of animal epidemics. Uh, very interesting and important work. And uh, then uh, April 29th, uh, we have Penelope Morell uh, speaking, I assume on immunology. Uh, and we have an open slot. And so if somebody from one of the subgroups would like to present in that open slot, uh, we would love to have a presentation from one of the subgroups. Uh, if not, uh, we are open to suggestions. Uh, and we have some a variety of uh, talks coming up. Uh, we're going to have a talk from one of the developers of the original uh, digital twin concept coming up uh, a little later in the summer. Uh, as always, we recommend we welcome your suggestions for additional speakers. Be very grateful for that. As usual, uh, during the meeting proper, uh, we would appreciate short questions and ones from people who don't normally ask the questions. Uh, and more general questions. Uh, we're going to have the nice half hour after the meeting, which I hope many of you can stay for. Uh, we'll do it open format where Denise and uh, James Moore will stay in, in the main meeting and they'll be able to talk to each other and to anybody who has questions. That worked really well last week. I hope it's uh, productive this week as well. And uh, if people look like they may be running over time a little bit, I'll give a five minute break into the speakers and give a five minute warning so we stay on time. I know it's very hard to keep uh, presentations into a 20 minute slot. They're really teasers uh, and opportunities. You're always welcome to come back. Denise and James, you're welcome to come back and give another talk with more detail. We most, most uh, welcome. Okay, so without more ado, we're going to move on to our first uh, mini seminar. Uh, James, James Moore, I guess you go, do you go. You said Jimmy Moore is the, your preferred salutation. Yeah, Jimmy, please, it's fine. Uh, and uh, on biotransport mechanisms for adaptive immunity, and people know that we're informal here, so we don't do big introductions. Uh, so I will just say, take it away, please. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and I assume I'm free to start sharing the slides. So uh, I, I'm really pleased to be part of uh, the program this evening. I've, I've tried to dial in a, a, a few times to these things, and it's just not at a great time of uh, a, a day here in London. But um, I'm really appreciative to, to the group and uh, for, for inviting me and for organizing these things. Um, second of all, I'm, real, I'm honored to be uh, the opening act for Denise Kirshner, uh, and, and I think you know, her, her uh, research has been a great inspiration to a lot of what we've been looking at in lymph nodes, and uh, look forward to hearing what she has to say this evening. So the first slide gives you a bit of a laundry list on the left of some of the research going on in my lab. The, the dark characters show the, well, the ones that are related to the lymphatic system, and, and really yeah, it's about two thirds of what goes on in the lab. The, the, the stuff in gray is, is the other things. Um, you know, we do uh, modeling, which you'll hear about today. We do experiments, which you'll hear a little bit about today. Um, and, and, but I'm, I'm always pushing my PhD students, my postdocs to think about what the results are telling them and, and try and come up with uh, device ideas or, 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 you know, ideas that can impact patient care. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we, that's what justifies our existence. And, um, and so, we, so we're always looking for ideas to come out of that. And, and as part of that, I, I actually run a medical device entrepreneurship program here. It's a master's program, uh, which is a lot of fun, but I'm not going to talk about that at all. So really my aim this evening is, is to kind of give a, a conversation starter, um, you know, a, a bit heavy on questions that we haven't answered yet and, uh, and a bit of results of the things that we have answered that we think we know. Um, and, and so I'll start out with a bit of an introduction to the lymphatic system. I find it, it well, we, we know that it's not taught as well as it should be in medical schools. And, uh, and that's true around the world. So a bit of an introduction here. Its main job is, uh, is fluid balance uh, going back from the periphery uh, into into the uh, into the blood circulation, so you have a net leakage of fluid out at the capillary level, and that fluid uh, is in, an important part of uh, of nutrition and and fluid balance and 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 tissue health. 
And uh, so that fluid's got to be gathered up and eventually returned to the blood system, uh, or you end up with swollen tissues, uh, and that's the condition lymphedema. Now, uh, all of the fluid that comes into here, the, the, the initial lymphatics are very porous, and uh, the fluid that comes in may have dirt and debris, uh, but may have cancer cells. Um, and uh, so, so that fluid needs to be filtered and cleaned and, and before it can be sent out um, back around the whole body in the blood system. That's the job of lymph nodes. You have about five or 600 of them in your body. Uh, and there are specialized blood vessels inside lymph nodes, which we should not ignore. Uh, they're very important. And it looks like um, metastatic cells that come into the lymphatic system will preferentially go into the lymph node blood vessels to get to the blood system. They less commonly continue on in, lymph in the lymphatic system, uh, which is an interesting phenomenon that was discovered a couple of years ago by Tim Padera and some other researchers. So uh, lymph nodes, hugely important. Um, now in terms of fluid mechanics, so I, I or started out as a mechanical engineer. And, and uh, so I, I like fluid mechanics. So blood flow, you get about five liters a minute cardiac output. Blood pressure, again, you probably know these numbers. Aortic diameter is two or three centimeters. The whole lymphatic system only pumps about five liters per day. So lo very low flow system. Uh, the biggest lymphatic vessels, about two, three millimeters in diameter. And the pressures, that's, that's not a misprint. The pressures vary from very far sub-atmospheric up to basically venous pressure, and uh, which is a, a very interesting phenomenon of lymphatic flow to look at. So you think about the lymphatics that drain the pleural side of the diaphragm, you gotta, you gotta keep your lungs inflated. So that's sub-atmospheric pressure already. And then you gotta drain fluid out of that. So it's even lower. So, uh, so those are the basic numbers of the system. Um, now, what I'd like to talk about today is, is um, a sort of a, a teaser and a, and a survey of what we've done in terms of adaptive immunity. So um, whether it's a, a, a vaccine or an infection that comes in through the skin, the job of the lymphatic system is to, or well, the immune system in general is to recognize it and then transport that information into the lymph node. So the, the, the key to the lymph node is that there is a, a high enough density of the proper immune cell types to develop adaptive immunity. So antigen recognition will happen in the periphery, but really uh, you know, the process of, of passing that information on to other immune cells, uh, it requires the, the cell densities that you find in lymph nodes. Um, so uh, you look at the interdermal space, uh, subcutaneous, intramuscular space, you have lymphatic vessels, initial lymphatics to varying degrees in, uh, in, in these tissues. And then what I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about first is these collecting lymphatic vessels that do the job of the pumping, of delivering that information into the lymph node. And then of course, once that information is processed, it can go into the specialized high endothelial venules. Um, th these are particularly uh, good at passing immune cells back and forth. And uh, so, so that some of that information can go into the HEV, some of it can go into the efferent lymph, but it all ends up back in the, in the systemic blood. And, uh, and then that information gets passed around the body. So the next time you encounter the infection, then, then you know what to do about it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about time scales. So we know that when antigens are delivered into say the uh, subcutaneous uh, space or even intramuscular space, they start showing up to in, in the lymph nodes within minutes. And these lymph nodes might be several centimeters away. So, uh, and, and this has been recognized in, in multiple animals, multiple lymph nodes, multiple injection locations. Uh, and, and one thing I, I find as I talk to uh, um, other types of scientists about this is it, they keep asking me, what about cell motility? So don't antigen presenting cells get the information and, and then sort of crawl their way to the nearest lymph node? Well, not really. Uh, antigen presenting cells do actively crawl uh, through the interstitium. They follow chemokine gradients to find their way into a lymphatic vessel. They crawl along, the, uh, along lymphatic vessel walls in the initial lymphatics, and, and that appears to be chemokine triggered as well. But the velocity they, they can reach is about five nanometers per minute. Um, and, and if you do the unit conversion in your head, you can see that it would take about four years to traverse a distance of one centimeter uh, at that velocity. So this is not 
a realistic option. Uh, let's say if you get uh, an infection in your toe, the nearest lymph node is in your knee. So uh, the cell crawling there is just not gonna work. So uh, the body has done uh, for the immune system what it has done for other systems. When you need to get something there fast, you, uh, you learn to do fluid mechanics. And, um, and I'll just add, even, even if the antigens are coming in uh, in suspension, the diffusion is, it would be similarly lim limited to, to a very long time scale. So this is how it happens. This is a rat mesenteric lymphatic vessel. Uh, the mesentery is chock full of lymphatics. You can stretch the mesentery of a rat over a microscope stage and you quickly find lymphatics. Uh, this one is about 100 microns in diameter. It's about the diameter of a human hair. Uh, these are really the workhorse vessels of the lymphatic system. They do pretty much all of the pumping. You can see some squeezing here, and that's true. There are, there are check valves just upstream and downstream of this image that keep the flow moving in the right direction. So within that lymphatic vessel, you will see cells floating through there. So those are uh, either lymphocytes or dendritic cells. So the white blood cells in your body. And uh, they are achieving a velocity about one centimeter per second. And if you're keeping score, that's eight orders of magnitude faster than they would be able to crawl. So, uh, so this is how we get information to the lymph node from the periphery. Um, the flow rate is about 200 microliters per hour. And I, I remember when my student, Brandon Dixon, who did these measurements, when he brought that to me, um, I said, wait a minute, did you just say we measured flow in microliters per hour? And he said, yes. And I, I, was, I was really pleased by that. It's a great unit of flow. Um, and, but uh, on the other hand, the, the peak wall shear stress ends up being about the same in your lymphatic vessels of these size as, as it is in the aorta. So you five liters a minute going through your aorta will produce about five dimes per square centimeter of shear stress. So interesting fluid mechanics there for sure. Now, uh, once that information gets to the lymph node, it comes in these afferent vessels. There are typically multiple afferent vessels feeding an individual lymph node. Um, there is a subcapsular sinus around the periphery uh, where the fluid comes in. There are B cell follicles uh, here. There's a T cell cortex. There's a medullary sinus, which is thought to be sort of the collection point for dumping fluid into the uh, efferent vessels. And um, if you look at sort of the, the flow pattern of how flow might come in, so it comes in from the afferent vessels, it can go into the subcapsular sinus. It actually might go around the periphery of the lymph node directly into the medullary sinus. Those connections have been recognized over and over again. Uh, it, or it can go through the sort of porous medium part of the lymph node, the B cell follicles, T cell cortex. And then there are blood vessels actually scattered through, through all of this where important fluid chain exchange happens as well. Now that subcapsular sinus is sort of an open region. It's like a parallel plate uh, flow situation if you're more of a fluid mechanics person like me. Um, the height of the subcapsular sinus is on the neighborhood of sort of 10 to 20 microns. And uh, so if, there, if there's an antigen presenting cell that comes in, it'll sort of sit in a subcapsular sinus and perhaps pass that information on to the, to the cells that line the basement of the subcapsular sinus here or, or pass that uh, or, or directly crawl in. And, and when they do, they follow uh, chemokine gradients within the lymph node as well. So chemokine gradients are important, not only in the periphery, but also in lymph nodes. Now, uh, so we, we wanted to know a bit more about the flow in, uh, in, these, uh, in these lymph nodes, how the lymph is distributed when it comes in. It's very difficult to measure. Uh, the Peclet number, which is sort of the ratio, ratio of diffusive to convective effects is on the order of unity in these vessels. So if you, if you put a fluorescent dye uh, into a lymph node, it'll diffuse about as fast as the fluid would move it. So it's actually hard to figure out what the flow velocities are. So we constructed a computational model and uh, using our, uh, you know, the best measurements we could find, some measurements we did ourselves. And, uh, and of course the need to keep the pressure differences realistic because keep in mind, all of the flow through the lymph node is being driven by the uh, afferent vessels, which can only generate a couple of centimeters of water of pressure. So it turns out most of the flow actually goes around the periphery. So this is a, remember the subcapsular sinus is this open region. 
it's very low, has a very low resistance to flow compared to the sort of meaty, porous media region of the lymph node. Um, the medullary sinus is also uh, relatively low resistance, somewhere in between the subcapsular sinus uh, hydraulic conductivity and that of the um, paracortex. So uh, that's the path of least resistance. That's where most of the flow goes under baseline healthy conditions when there is no response to uh, antigen going on. Um, now this flow uh, will deliver antigens. So antigens can be directly suspended into the lymph and come in. And, and some of that will certainly go into the, to the T cell cortex here, into the B cell follicle regions. And uh, that can occur uh, along some interesting structures, um, uh, these collagen conduits that, that exist in, in the lymph nodes. And, that, and there's a size selective filtering. It's, I mean, it's an absolutely fascinating little chemical engineering factory in, inside these lymph nodes. And hopefully Denise will tell us a lot more about that. Um, also, these flow patterns are important in determining the chemokine gradients in, uh, in lymph nodes. So if you try and predict what chemokine concentrations are in the lymph node with just diffusion, you will go wrong. You will go horribly wrong. You need to incorporate the fluid flow in order to reconstruct what these chemokine gradients are in, inside the lymph node. And again, that's another interesting chemical engineering problem. So. Um, one thing that we did was uh, we, we subjected some lymph nodes to, uh, these are actually vaccine adjuvants, uh, L LPS and poly-IC. And, uh, and we looked at the, the resistance, uh, the flow resistance. So this is the pressure drop across the lymph node uh, divided by the flow rate through the lymph node. And remember these flow rates are, are you know, maybe a hundred microliters per hour the pressure differences are a couple of centimeters of water. These are exquisite little measurements to do. And uh, so what we find is about an order of magnitude increase in flow resistance in these lymph nodes within 24 hours. And within 72 hours, it goes back to baseline. And so the, your time scale for lymph node swelling, which is something you're probably familiar with when you get sick, your lymph nodes swell. Lymph nodes will swell typically 24 to 48 hours after the infection. So, so this is really the, the, high, the, the resistance to flow goes up a lot faster than the lymph node swells and then goes back down probably before the lymph node is finished doing its, all of its swelling. So this, uh, this got us puzzled. You know, if, if the thing's not changed much in size yet, what about this is causing a change in uh, flow resistance? So then we went back to the computational model and we started varying things as you do with the computational model. So the first thing they did was uh, vary the hydraulic conductivity of the T cell cortex. Mind you, five minutes. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, but remember only 10% of the flow is coming to the, into the middle here under baseline conditions. So with 90% of the flow going around this low resistance pathway here, you could change that hydraulic conductivity all you want, it does nothing. To the, to the overall flow resistance of the lymph node. Um, we also changed the height of that subcapsular sinus. Uh, we doubled it, we halved it, we did all kinds of things to it. And uh, we could only produce about that much change in the overall flow resistance of the lymph node. Um, the next thing we did was we changed the hydraulic conductivity of the medullary sinus. So that's this sort of collection point down at the bottom here, it is part of the low resistance pathway. So not surprisingly, I guess, uh, if you change the hydraulic conductivity of the, um, of the medullary sinus uh, by an order of magnitude, which would not be hard to do in a porous medium, then you end up being able to explain all of the change in the, uh, in the, uh, the overall flow resistance of the lymph node. That's the only part of the lymph node that we change that produced anything close to the uh, flow resistance change that we measured in the experiments. So that is what we think is, is causing the change. We, we, we suspect there is a specialized kind of cell in the medullary sinus that when it senses an antigen to respond to, that it shuts down that low resistance pathway, sends more of the flow into the middle. So it about triples the flow into the T cell cortex when it shuts down that low resistance pathway, which uh, I mean, all of this makes sense, but uh, I guess we had to sit around and, and do some modeling and some experience to figure it out. So um, 
Now, these are, as I mentioned, this poly-IC and LPS, they're, they're uh, sometimes used as vaccine adjuvants in, in animal experiments, at least. So I thought I'd uh, end the talk with talking a bit about what we think about vaccine adjuvants. So I'll give a bit of history. Uh, like many good medical stories, the history begins in London here. So there was Alexander Glenny was doing some experiments in the south part of London um, on vaccines. And he noticed that when they showed signs of inflammation around the injection site, that the vaccine worked better. So he started sort of inducing inflammation around the injection site by adding aluminum salt uh, or alum to the, uh, to, to, to the vaccine. Um, and he found it worked. And uh, as things went in the 1920s, if, you, if something worked, then you just walked over to the human hospital and you started injecting people and away you go. We probably ha all have had uh, alum in, injected into us as part of vaccines that we've had. It's been used millions uh, of times, literally. And it continues to be the most common vaccine adjuvant. Funny thing is, uh, nobody really knows how it works, whether it works in the periphery, whether it works in the lymph node. Uh, Glenning himself proposed something called the depot theory, which is that um, it irritates things uh, around the injection site to the point where more immune cells come there. Uh, there's actually not much evidence for that. Um, so since then, there's you know, very little support for the depot theory. It is still the dogma in the field. And I've had immunologists get angry with me for suggesting that it may not be the case. Um, there are two additional types of adjuvants that have been developed, oil and water emulsions, TLR activators. Um, uh, TLR activators are very effective, but they're uh, toxic. Uh, the ones that work well in mice um, don't necessarily work well in humans. Um, nobody really knows how they, they work either. So if you think about the job of a vaccine designer, how do you pick one? And the, the answer is nobody knows. They just kind of try one. And if it seems to work, then they go with it. Um, and, I, and, and I'll just, I, I'm not going to show the results today, but I'll tell you, our preliminary results show that all three types of adjuvants actually shut down that lymphatic pumping. That's the that squeezing of those collecting vessels that delivers the information from the periphery into the lymph node. So if you're trying to get information into the lymph node quickly, using an adjuvant's not the way to go. So let's go back to our picture here then. So let's think about what's, what's the job here. The job is to deliver the information from the syringe, get it into the lymph node where there's a high enough de density of immune cells to do something about it. Um, so we'd like to know, you know, sort of starting with the lymph node, I think is the right way to go here. So what temporal profile of antigen delivery does the lymph node need in order to do its job? And uh, so step one, peripheral uptake. All right, well, we're injecting them intramuscular where there are not many lymphatics. Um, step two is to uh, get them into the prenatal lymphatics. And we know that adjuvants downregulate lymphatic pumping. Um, so what's that do for us? Well, if we're trying to slow things down, then our first two steps are, are doing the right thing. but don't know if that's the right thing to do. Um, and then within the, um, the lymph node, the, you know, our results show that uh, it increases the flow into the T cell zone to, to add these adjuvants in. So, so what does that all do? We don't know, we'd like, uh, we'd, like, we'd like to know more about this system so we can provide for the vaccine manufacturers a, a platform for designing uh, vaccine adjuvants and deciding which one should go with their particular antigen. So uh, uh, just wrapping up the lymphatics, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a commonly uh, studied system, which makes it the land of opportunity for me and, and other people that are crazy enough to take it on. Um, the lymphatic pumping, we've done a lot of work on this over the years, and uh, it's, it's a fascinating fluid mechanics problem. And uh, that's the only way you get information into your lymph nodes quickly enough to do anything about it. And again, I think we need for vaccines, we need to start with the lymph node. What does it need? What time course does it need in terms of antigen delivery and how can we uh, design adjuvants that do that? So with that, I'll close with uh, acknowledgements to the people that really did the work and great collaborators and great funding sources. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing what Denise has to say. Okay, thank you very much. I will. If it's okay, I think we'll hold the questions to the end. And I'll just come over to Denise. 
So we have Denise Kirshner as our second talk, is going to be talking about her multi-scale modeling efforts uh, on tuberculosis infection and treatment. And uh, I'll turn it, I don't wanna take any more of her time, I'll turn it over to her immediately. Um, I can't share my screen just yet, James. Maybe you give me a screen, oh, there we go. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, well, I, I really would just rather talk about James's talk because it was awesome and I have so many questions and thoughts. So I'm kind of frustrated. I tried to write everything down. I hope I remember Jimmy when we're done, <laughs> but that was amazing. Um, I wish I'd known you were talking about that because maybe I would have talked more about lymph node stuff. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it today. So um, a lot of you have seen me give uh, talks before on uh, the biology um, and the study of t tuberculosis. We've done it for about the past 20 years. Um, um, we call it a systems biology approach because we believe systems biology is a m use of multiple modalities to understand a single biological problem. And so we believe that um, that TB is very complex and it requires multiple modalities. So here I'm showing you a lung resection from a non-human primate with a granuloma in it. This is a human granuloma. Here's our computer simulation. Um, so there's multiple actions of this. So. TB uh, is actually the number one cause of death in the world due to infectious disease and about one and a half to two million people die a year. So even in the face of COVID, it's a major morbidity and you know it certainly doesn't get as much attention because it tends to be a third world disease, um, but it is, is, is as important. And uh, what got me interested in this disease was this trajectory that you either clear infection if you're exposed, only a small percent of people get active disease where if they don't get treated, they'll die. But most people are able to contain it and experience what we think as latent disease. So what I'm showing you here on the right is a PET CT scan from a non-human primate where we've infected it with 24 bacteria that were barcoded. And you can see that each granuloma formed an individual, it was formed by an individual bacterium. So these are collections of immune cells that um, serve to immunologically restrain and physically contain the bacteria because it can't really clear it. So it kind of builds a wall and walls it off. But what you notice here at four days post, uh, four weeks post infection, there's a single granuloma here. And at five weeks, it's it's spreading. So there are, so this monkey will probably um, do bad um, and die from the infection. And um, just for Jimmy's sake here, these are lymph nodes showing you that there is spread of multiple bacterial types and antigens to the lung draining lymph nodes in this case. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The, the problem with TB is that of course, um, of these 90% that have been infected and are latent, there's a chance of reactivation about 5 to 10% per lifetime. And if you study viral infections or immunosuppression, things like HIV, um, that can reactivate tuberculosis and uh, lead you to a 5 to 10% per year, which is a, a main problem. We have a fantastic animal model with a collaborator at University of Pittsburgh, Joanne Flynn, who we have a colony of 300 monkeys that uh, provides much of the data that we use to calibrate and validate our models. So this is a multi-scale modeling consortium. So we um, believe that this is a multi-scale process and uh, the molecular scale dynamics, including drugs and chemokines and cytokines are behaving, um, interacting with things at the cellular scale, coming together at the tissue scale to form these granulomas. And of course, there's organ scale um, dynamics happening with things moving in and out from the lymph node, as well as the, um, the blood compartment as things travel back and forth. And so this, of course, is contained within a whole host. So we care very much about um, building an agent-based model that can track every individual immune cell in lung tissue and what it's doing that leads to these granulomas um, because they've been a veritable black box to study, similar to lymph nodes. And we've done similar studies like this for lymph nodes as well. And so uh, we track immune cells of different types and bacteria and, um, and things are diffusing. We also have vascular sources in our lung. And, um, and what's amazing about this is when we run this agent-based model, Model, we the emergent behavior is actually the formation of a granuloma and this model has been continuously curated now for uh, over 15 years with data and updated with new immunolo immunology um, and biology uh, data as it becomes available so here's an example from a non-human primate of an immunohistochemistry stained tissue showing a granuloma. And you can see here we have uh, some dead tissue in the middle surrounded by rings of um, the blue is actually uh, neutrophils. Then we have um, uh, 
um, macrophages and then surrounded by lymphocytes. And so um, you can see that our simulation gives you a very similar type of a structure. But more importantly, we can track over time from the origin of dropping that initial bacterium into the system, how this thing dynamically changes. And as modelers, of course, our goal is to be able to manipulate this tool once we're sure it's working well to kind of make many predictions about what's going on. We use this model to study lots of different aspects of both immunology as well as things like vaccines and treatment. This granuloma is going to run for 200 days because infection with TB lasts a lifetime of a host and these granulomas last a lifetime. We find tubercles in uh, Egyptian mummies. So this is an ancient disease and that lives the length of the host. You can see here this granuloma that's forming is kind of splitting into two granuloma and there's casein developing in the center of both of them. So lots of bacteria present there. Um, I'm just showing you here that our uh, our vast number of simulations matches what's identified in the non-human primate, at least through the first about 120 days. We, we haven't really had monkeys that are longer than about uh, four months. Um, um, we usually necropsy by then. So we use these analysis tools of uncertainty and sensitivity analysis to figure out how much um, parameter variation influences the model outcomes, and then if it there are variations which parameters are driving that behavior and that's what the sensitivity analysis tells us and it's really exciting because it can quantify the relationship over time so what's contributing to the granuloma formation dynamics early versus what's happening later and we we published this paper many years ago now and we have the programs available in MATLAB and R on our website for anybody to use that wants to perform these um, studies so for this basic grand sim model that I just showed you here is the results of the sensitivity analysis. So I'm showing you partial rank correlations on the right. Um, it's similar to regular correlations, although these are for nonlinear systems. And you can see that the parameters that are playing a role early in infection in the first 50 days, very different from the parameters that are playing a role later in infection, you know, out to day 200 here. And, and so we're able to sort of classify these in different categories, um, things that are involved with this tumor necrosis factor, rates that T cells are recruited to move around the lymph node, macrophage activation rates, how well the intracellular bacteria are growing, and what's going on with this dead tissue in the center of these granulomas. So um, this allows us then to have targets to do further study, build molecular scale level models that are submodels that we can put on the bottom of, these, of this mesoscale model to ask more questions as well as build larger scale models to link to this. So we've spent a lot of work in this area and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about those sorts of models that we've done. So now in this particular case, I just want to talk to you about why TB is so hard to treat. So there's three main reasons. The first is that the bacteria, it grows very slowly. For example, E. coli doubles every 20 minutes. It takes mycobacterium about 24 to 48 hours to double. Um, also, there's antibiotic resistance. In terms of the granulomas, they themselves form a physiological barrier to antibiotic diffusion. So here's um, from a rabbit model, which form beautiful granulomas um, similar to humans. We've treated with two separate drugs, and you can see in this drug, it doesn't penetrate at all into the caseous area. In this drug, it can somewhat penetrate, but most of the drug is concentrated sort of here in the macrophage ring, um, not much in the T cell area here. And then um, it's patient unfriendly. You have to treat as long as nine months. Most people are treated six to nine months. Multiple drugs are given. The standard regimen is made up of isoniazid, rifampicin, uh, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. And there are many side effects. Now, most people don't normally finish their 10-day course of antibiotics. So actually completing nine months um, is a difficult task. And noncompliance immediately leads to the emergence of drug resistance. So it's an incredibly important problem. The World Health Organization has now put a stop TB campaign to the year 2030 um, out and there is a lot of effort to shorten the amount of time that drugs are needed and maybe even reduce the number of drugs given to help compliance strength, strengthen. So what we've done is taken this grand sim granuloma simulator model and we've put a plasma pharmacokinetic and a tissue pharmacodynamic model running inside of it. And so another multi-scale here for these molecules uh, and tracking multiple transit compartments of drugs. So, you know, first you have to swallow it right and then it has to get into your, you know, different tissues, get to the plasma, then get into the periphery so it can get to the lung tissue. And then, of course, what are the dynamics? And what we assume here is that um, the antibiotic 
antibiotic killing rate is proportional to the C50 or the uh, half max of, um, of killing here. And this assumption is well known in the literature. So um, here's an example. You, ooh, sorry, here's an example showing you that um, the drugs actually stay um, below what you need the C50 to be um, for most of the time. So these are different populations of bacteria um, because we look at the environment that the bacteria in that determines its growth rate. And you can see no matter what region it's in, the drugs are not above the C50 very long. And this is treating every day. Um, so you can imagine why someone has to treat for nine months to be able to really get at all the bacteria load. Something extremely interesting, here is an example granuloma, and I'm treating with two separate drugs, and what you can see here is when you treat with one drug, um, immediately um, the drug this one here, uh, isoniazid, has the half-life, it's, it's basically gone. Rifampin is stayed around a little while before the second um, drug delivery is given on the next day, but you can see most of the drug is located outside of the granuloma and not penetrating into the granuloma. And so, again, this is information that's really been a black box for pharmacologists, biologists studying granulomas, and we're able to visualize that here and make predictions about how we can improve this process. So one of the things we did is we were able to look at a couple of different types of granulomas. Um, and we looked at the combination therapy that's given basically to everyone in the clinic right now. For And it's given to you whether you have latent TB or active disease. Um, you are given this therapy of HRZE unless you have a resistance and then they swap in other drugs, which I'll talk about in a minute. So um, if, you're, if your granulomas are all good, so it probably looks more like you're a latent person, you can see that if you give any of the individual drugs, you don't do well unless you've been given uh, rifampicin, which is almost as good as given all four at the same time. But if you have granulomas that are sort of doing poorly and really probably likely in a person who's active disease, what you see happening is that the combin it only the combination will get you to all the granulomas being sterilized, which is what the goal is of treatment in this case is to clear the bacteria load. Um, but it all of it takes at least 200 days here on treatment to even begin to get to that point in the bad granuloma case, and it takes about 120 days to reach that in the good granuloma case. Okay, so another major question is, well, you know, um, what is the best antibiotic regimens? So what if you had, for example, two treatment segments, like an initial phase and a longer phase? What if you had 10 possible drugs and you had four drugs you were going to give per segment and you had five possible doses that you could give for every one of the drugs and you had, you know, a frequency of once a day, twice a week, you know, three times a week, seven possible frequencies. That number of combinations is 10 to the 17th. And so we refer to that as the regimen design space. That's even too many for computational modeling to be effective. So what we have to do, and certainly too many for, to do clinically, is create an optimization system to study this. And that's just what we've done. So we sort of looked using two different methods, a genetic algorithm method and something known as surrogate assisted optimization, which comes from the engineering side of things. And so two things are important here. We're, we're trying to come up with an optimization approach and also an objective function. So of course, genetic algorithms are at, act in a way that you initialize a population, you see how it evolves over time, you have a stopping criteria, and you're done when you feel like you've hit the perfect fitness. Surrogate assisted optimization, you don't really have any idea um, what you're looking for, but you guess. And um, and then you you notice that you're looking for lots of local minima here for your for your or maxima depending on what your question is. So we need an objective function for that. And here we've just used something simple like time to clearance and dose frequency, and we're trying to minimize that. And so the idea is you actually are creating a surface for the different things you're looking for, and you're looking for either the maximum or the minimum, so the peak or the valley on your topograph, um, and you're trying to get to that point. So if we do that, the genetic algorithm gets us right there. Even if I relax some of my conditions for my genetic algorithm, it gets me there after a few steps. For my radial basis functions, I kind of wander all over the place, and I never hit the exact point, but I get pretty close. The problem is, is that GrandSim takes about 20 minutes to 
uh, 20 to 30 minutes to run a simulation. So for the default genetic algorithm, it took me almost 4,000 evaluations of that to find that optimal. The relaxed one took me one order of magnitude less, and finally the surrogate assisted took 21. So even though it wasn't the best, it ran the quickest. So what we did was apply a couple of ways to sort of improve the surrogate assisted, and that's what we're using now in our optimization. Okay, the other thing I have to tell you is that's for a single drug. If you want to do multiple drug optimization, we look for something known as Pareto fronts and try to um, find our target region for minimizing antibiotic dose and minimizing average time to sterilization. So I want to tell you um, in the last five minutes here about something interesting um, that we've done recently, and that is... Um, there was a clinical study recently that said that, well, you take HRZE, let's swap in this drug moxifloxacin for the ethambutol and see what happens here. Because ethambutol has been around for a while, maybe it needs some improvement. And so they said it didn't really help much. Well, we did. We went ahead and did that same study. And what we found is, yes, you, you get some benefit, but that there were two other regimens that if you swapped out, you did much better. One, RMZE was almost as good as HRZE, and another one, HMZE, was also good under certain conditions. So right now, Joanne and the monkeys have been testing um, these other regimens to see if that actually is borne out in the, um, in the primate model. So finally, I want to tell you what we're thinking about relating to the translatability. So everything I've told you about, you should be questioning me because I've told you everything about a single granuloma. But I showed you very early on that monkeys and humans form multiple granuloma in the lungs, and it really only takes one bad one. So you could have 20 granuloma, 19 of them sterilize, and your body's doing a great job. One of them does a bad job, and you better treat that or that person's going to die. We do not know. We think it's location, location, location about where that initial bug lands, closer to a blood vessel, closer to an airway, closer to a lymph node. We're not really sure, um, but that's part of our ongoing work right now. And so what our goal is then is to, is to be able to create a virtual human to scale to the host and then also be able to run what we call virtual clinical trials. And so towards that goal, we're trying to build a virtual human that runs the gamut of all the different scales of interest and so we can address questions in all these different areas of vaccine, drugs, immunotherapies, biomarker discovery, and virtual clinical trials. So to do that for TB, I want to convince you that I only need three compartments. I need the lungs, I need the blood, and I need the lung draining lymph nodes. And for most people of those 90% that have latent TB in the world, those 2 billion people, these are the main compartments that TB is confined to. There's much data to show that. Of course, people get extra pulmonary TB. Children actually don't even get it in their lungs, but we're talking about the majority of people. So this is where we're starting. So what we have done is taken a non-human primate lung and digitized it XYZ coordinates. And we have that now as our background of our model. We've So this is a new model now. It's not GrandSim anymore. We're calling this model HostSim. We've got six lymph nodes in the lung draining lymph nodes that are that are there for primates actually there's like five in humans and seven in monkeys so we've we've got six sort of balance the two we have blood vessels in our model and then of course we have granulomas forming over time I will tell you that in this story, Jimmy, we have are considering our lymph nodes as homogeneous, well-mixed um, compartments. We, as you know, we've done other work as lymph nodes with agent-based modeling. We don't think we need that right now. We just need them to be supplying um, cells to, to the site of infection. But later, we, we have to add the more detail and figure out how to get them there. So what I'm showing you on the left here is our lung, and you can see I'm um, showing you just two lymph nodes now. And these are going to be the vessels showing you cells flowing from the lymph nodes to the site of infection, and you'll see the granulomas begin to start. So I don't have the key on here. I'm very sorry about that. But darker color means that more cells are flowing. Um, and so you'll begin to see granulomas forming. You'll begin to see the lymph nodes changing color um, as, as, as uh, dendritic cells take antigen to the lymph node, um, and then those cells will begin to flow. Now the lymph nodes are changing color and, and being able to populate these granulomas and help fight the infection. But you will also see right here, more granulomas are spreading and starting. So this 
um, example this person is doing or primate virtual human is doing poorly and um, and so you're getting the birth of many new granulomas that are seeded and so unless we treat this individual they will die and so what we're able to do now is run multiple um, virtual hosts here or digital twins however you want to refer to that and um, and then we have a population and so we've been using this to test drug regimens to test vaccines um, and we've published work on those areas and you all can see that um, on my website so um, I just want to tell you that models are very important uh, they're complex I think there's a lot of tools that are needed to study these things and considering um, really mechanistic models I think is a key to really translatable um, our tools have been this sensitivity analysis we use, numerical implementation and how you link these compartments. And also, we don't always need other compartments running, so we do something called tunable resolution where we fine and coarse grain our model compartments as, as needed as we run, and we can even automate that to happen naturally. Uh, we continuously curate our models and validate them um, regularly um, to be sure that we're staying up with the latest. Um, we build our models middle out and we um, are applying it in many areas. And we encourage, of course, collaboration. And I have a fantastic group of people at Michigan and also uh, Joanne Flynn at Pittsburgh and Veronique D'Artois um, at uh, CDI in New Jersey who supplies our drug data to us. And we have a new collaboration with the Gates Foundation um, with Karim Azir um, and a new one also with Bree Aldridge and Sriram about drugs in TB. So thanks for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Denise. You're a quick speaker. That was an incredible amount of material in a short time. <laughs> You'll have to play it back in slow motion on YouTube when you... Um... So, I, I, I don't know anything I say at this point will be something of an anticlimax. Um, just to just to say that before we before we go to the discussion, we're always eager to have your feedback uh, for suggestions to how to make these meetings better, uh, for suggestions about how to organize the working group more effectively. Um, we uh, are working on a statement of goals, as people know, we'd appreciate your help. Uh, and uh, we definitely would like to hear from our subgroups. Uh, so please, if you're a subgroup leader, be willing to report. Reinhardt, is there any business that you wanted to take before we go on to questions and discussion? No, I think I don't think I'd want to interrupt the flow of that one. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I think that we'll call we'll say that the the business part of the meeting is done, and I will open the floor to uh, a couple of general questions, and then in five minutes we have a free for all. So let's start out with a few uh, not too technical questions for either of our speakers, and then in five minutes all the gloves can come off. I have, I have one if nobody's going to start. Uh, I always read that humans don't have uh, formal pumps for the lymphatic system, whereas birds do. Uh, the birds have lymph hearts. Uh, but the flow velocities you're reporting for human lymph flow are very fast. So if, if flow velocities for, for lymph are so quick, why do, why do birds need lymph hearts to pump lymph actively? Yeah, it's it's uh, there, there's a big variety in, in lymphatic system physiology in the animal kingdom. So amphibians also have lymph hearts, from what I've heard. Um, you know, it are uh, the it's a shame I didn't show the valves on either side of the uh, of that pumping lymphangion. But basically, the you know for a 100 micron diameter lymphatic vessel, the valves will be about every 10 millimeters, about, about every, uh, sorry, about every millimeter or 10 vessel diameters. So they were really just off the screen there. Um, you know, the, the, the lymphatic muscle cells in the walls of the vessels can contract and they do so about every two seconds or so. Um, but you can also get, you know, kind of like vein, vein pumping, you, you know, you can get ex external compression from external tissues, pushing the fluid along. It, it actually does a pretty good job of moving that five liters a day back up to your shoulder. It's fighting gravity, obviously in humans, um, not so much in birds, 
So I think it's, uh, you know, the, there, there is a big difference perhaps in, in the valve structure. Maybe, maybe the birds don't have um, valves in their lymphatic vessels. I'm, I'm not really sure, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a, that's a great comparative anatomy uh, study someday to look at that for sure. Other, so other one, one time for one more general question before we, we continue the discussion. Anyone? So my question was somewhat general. I was asking about uh, Denise Kirshner's fantastic talk. Uh, she briefly mentioned middle out model building. So if she could just say a little bit more about that philosophy. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the idea is what we do is we sort of focus the model on what we really think is the compartment or the scale of major interest. And so we put our energy there first, but then of course there's peripherals. In our case, there's molecular scale details that you might blow out south, and then there's other details that you might blow out north from, from that scale. So in our case, we, we started with the granuloma, which is really what we think is the center of the universe for the TB, but then we need to think about the fact, well, there's lots of dynamics happening at the molecular scale. There's also things happening in other compartments, but we started with the, the most detail in the middle, the meso scale, and then we build out north and south from that, and even east and west, adding the other organs and things on, um, depending on you know what questions we want to ask. So for example, when we found out from the sensitivity analysis that TNF to necrosis factor, which is a cytokine, was important, we built an entire 21 equation submodel of TNF, all the bindings and the receptor ligand interactions and how they're produced and internalized, and then we can have that running inside all of our macrophages in the model at any time we want. So that would be an example of building something south from my mesoscale. Um, but we don't necessarily need that TNF dynamics running all the time. So we have a way to sort of use this tunable resolution idea where you can turn on and off that scale model as needed, but in a very smart way based on what we learn from having that model running um, inside of there. So that's a general idea. I hope that was clear. Yes, uh, very stimulating. Thank you. Okay, so we are at the canonical hour. I hope many people will be able to stick around and have a discussion with our two speakers. I think, I think, as you say, uh, sort of by accident, the, the 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 talks went very well together. So good to keep everyone together. So I will now turn it over, and if if people want to screen share, I can unscreen. I I will unshare the screen so that you have it available, uh, and. Uh, I will open it up for a general discussion. I hope we have a lively half hour of discussion. Well, I have lots of questions for Jimmy, so I don't know. If, <laughs> but I don't want to hog. You should let your people ask. If, but if nobody has, I have a lot. So maybe start. Are there other questions with our, our audience? Don't be shy, please. I think we'll learn something from hearing Denise's questions, too. I had a quick question for you, Denise. Um, that was a great talk. So my name is Mitchell, I'm at NC State. Um, I do a lot of cardiovascular modeling, but we deal with lumped parameter models a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Always this question about how many compartments do you need, but also how many compartments um, can you have and still have uniquely identifiable parameters? So I wanted to ask, how do you address that problem when you're picking the number of compartments uh, that, that are needed to address the problem that you're dealing with? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I, so I have two answers. One, we're actually working in parameter identifiability right now. There's a lot of work been done in, in ODEs. Marissa Eisenberg and Marissa Renardi from my group have a paper coming out on parameter identifiability in PDEs, but but you know, agent-based modeling, all bets are off. So, so now let me get back to the, the real heart of the matter. So the way I see it is that all models that you build are phenomenological and mechanistic. Sometimes you have a real mechanistic representation of certain things, and sometimes in the same model, you have a very phenomenological, which is what you're saying is like lump a bunch of things into representing that term, okay? Um, so, so what I think happens is when you do your when you do your uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, It'll tell you, okay, these, this is important, this is important, and this is important. If it keeps coming up that the phenomenological representation is important, then my suggestion to you is it is time to build a submodel that actually blows that out and you do the detail. And then you're able to, in a very smart way, 
if you don't want that running all the time, shut it off and then replace it with very um, sleek term that really captures the, the main thing that you learn from that submodel um, rather than just having like a rate of something coming in, but it's capturing it in a little bit wiser way. And, and that's informed by actually doing the full blown out um, submodel. But that's exactly what we do, what you just described. That's how we do it. Because, I mean, you have to make some choices of what's going to be in and what's going to be out. And so in the mesoscale in particular, you know, you're very myopic in what's going in your Petri dish, um, right? And then you decide, okay, well, I'm just going to ignore, you know, that. But then later something tells you, gosh, I really have to pay attention to that. So. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question and I'm asking the same question many people. So you use the term prediction, which is kind of problematic because we, we really cannot predict the future. Uh, and anyone who claims it is, has a big problem because they have to prove it. And usually they can't. So now my question is like, you also mentioned that you validate stuff. And here, this is a problem that actually was something that was uh, addressed in our white paper that we're coming out in the integration working group. You do a lot of integration work. And uh, my question is specifically, how do you validate all those small little components? And actually, how predictive are you? Are you really doing prediction? Can you actually predict something? Or are you more talking about forecast or projection? Okay, good question, Jacob. And so what I think, actually, we're predicting backwards, not forwards. We're saying, why did that happen? As so, a you're not, so you're not predicting, you're trying to explain. Yes, there you go. Sure. Thank we you. Call, yes. Thank you. Important correction. Yes. And then number two, um, you know, what, your second part of your question was the validation piece. So we actually take our cues from the experimental world, experimental world to validate their mouse model of something, human disease. What they'll do is do knockouts. They'll treat it with certain things and ask, do we see the same sorts of behaviors, dynamics over time as what's seen in actual situations? And so that's exactly what we run our models through. We run it through all the same knockouts, validations, these sorts of things. And that those are some of the main ways that we validate our models to see that the behavior is overall working right. And I, I will also be very clear to say is any data that we use to build our models, we are agnostic to when we validate. That's a completely different set of data that we use to validate the models that we use to calibrate and build our models. And we put blinders on for both. So that way we don't jade ourselves into, you know, putting something in and saying, oh, look what we got out. Well, of course you got that out because you put it in. So we, we don't, we don't do that. So we try to be honest about it because we think that's really important particularly to convince our biology colleagues that what we're doing is is you know sensical yeah yeah that, this, these are good answers so first of all it's like it seems that we need to change the language a little bit this is why i'm saying because the term prediction is problematic because people who see this outside academia they say oh uh can they really predict and the answer is typically no we cannot still predict we're very far from the ability to predict uh, but so this is a correction I'm telling, I'm, I'm raising this question again and again for a reason. It has to be corrected at our level so that people who read the papers eventually be, believe that's like we can actually do something useful. We don't any, uh, have to convince only the biologists. This is like at, the, at our level, we have to understand this. But more importantly, you said that you have different pieces of data. How many pieces of data you have and how do they look like? Give us an example of something where you have a, a, a different sets and tell us for the different levels of multi-scale exactly what you're doing because this is important for us to learn. Okay, um, so I'll try to do this quickly. Let me tell you that what I think First of all, we have a paper and maybe um, there's somebody who's doing an amazing job of like finding um, papers and sticking them in the chat. I don't know who that is, but you're awesome, whoever you are. I love that idea. If you can look up um, the word Calipro, um, C-A-L-I-P-R-O, and find that paper. We just recently published a paper called Calipro. I think it was in BMC System Biology. I cannot remember what journal. Um, but um, but that paper does it shows you th that we use when you have different types of data is when you um, actually um, do. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking. Yes, I have different types of data here. Um, you need different types of approaches. So can I share the screen um, for a second? Is that all right with you? Thank you. Go ahead. Um, 
Thank you, James. So, um, so for example, from the non-human primate data, we have um, flow cytometry data. We have something called Boolean gating and spice analysis data, which tells you different cells and what they're making. We have the number of bacteria per granuloma over time. We have all sorts of data. We also have spatial data. So this is something called a, um, a PET CT scan showing us the, which granulomas are, where they are, if they're hot, meaning that they've been incorporating uh, FDG, which is a glucose marker, and we can track that. Um, they can do this a few times on the monkeys before necropsy. And then we also get this immunohistochemistry data at the time of necropsy. So we have both spatial data as well as temporal data. And I think it takes a special approach to calibrate a model and validate a model to these different types of data sets. And so CaliPro is a method that we've come up with recently because we've thought a lot about this question, um, about what do you do with different types of data and, um, and multiple types of data that you're trying to simultaneously make everybody happy at the same time. So my short answer is you have to read that paper. And if somebody just found it and put it in the chat, thank you. Thank you for putting it in the chat. <laughs> thank you. So, hi, I actually have a lymph node question, if I'm coming through. Please, please go ahead. Um, that was, both these talks were amazing, <laughs> um, which is not a question. Do you think the lymph node pressure drops finding that you're seeing are also going to, to apply to non-professional lymph nodes, the lymphoid tissue in the nasal passages, in the lungs? Do you think it your findings are gonna be applicable there as well. Yeah, so there, I mean, there are lots of uh, sort of lymph node-like structures that get yeah. set up around the body, uh, either permanently or temporarily. And um, I mean, I, I, the answer is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would suspect not because, uh, you know, the lymph node is really sort of a, a little factory unto itself with its own blood vessel supply. Uh, and I think these, uh, these tertiary lymphatic organs are, are a bit looser in structure. So I, I, I doubt it's gonna be such a, a cut and dry case of, you know, there are some definite afferent vessels and definite efferent vessels that we can use to do the measurement. You know, for example, with a lymph node, and I'm not, I'm not sure that's the case with these other lymphatic structures. And then following up on that, and this may be incredibly naive, but do you think your findings are for normal lymph nodes, are they lymph node universal? Are there differences otherwise in lymph nodes associated with different parts of the body who are going to have different expected routes of antigen delivery? Yeah, I, I wish I knew. I, I, <laughs> you know, this is, uh, I, those, so that I should explain those were mouse lymph nodes. Okay. Uh, that we were doing. Uh, uh, the mouse lymph nodes are about a millimeter in diameter, uh, so an order of magnitude smaller than a human lymph node, roughly. And uh, as far as I know, that is the only measurement of lymph node flow resistance in the in the history of mankind. <laughs> so, oh, it was amazing. <laughs> well, it's it's a, it's a cool experiment for sure, but it's it you know it's a good example of um, you know how little we know about the lymphatic system just because you know, there are not that many people doing it. Um, I, I wish we knew more. Oh, I thought I didn't know because I had missed it in the literature. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's oh. not there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. This is John Rice. I have a question. And, and by the way, all due respect to people who ask naive questions if they think they're naive and aren't afraid to ask them. Thank you. <laughs> but the, um, you know, both of you seem to have a, a pretty well integrated model and then laboratory type of research capability. And, and Denise mentioned something about using experiments to validate models. And I'm curious about the, the degree of experimental design associated with testing a model and you know is it is it do you have a laboratory experiment that tells you something and you build a model to test what the laboratory said or or you have a model and now you're going to do a laboratory experiment to test 
whether the model could conceivably be right. And so in the design of experiment, classical scientific design of experiment side, um, so you take the model and you develop a hypothesis and then you test a real hypothesis um, that and, and your hypothesis about something work, how something works is, you know, that if you manipulate a variable in the model, X happens. And so the experiment is that if I make that manipulation in variables in the real world, the same thing happens to some degree of probability. Yeah, Jimmy, why don't you answer that? Because you do a little bit more of the experiments and I think my answer is a little different than yours. So why don't you go? Yeah, well, I, I think what you said earlier, Denise, was was our approach is we we try and build our models based on a certain set of data and train them and whatnot. But then when it comes to validation, we we grab some set of data that the models never heard of before. And I think that's 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 a really crucial thing to do. I mean, if you um, you know, if you teach your dog to bark whenever he sees the postman and, and the dog barks when he sees the postman, you can't really brag on that, you know. So I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we benefit a lot from the literature. Uh, no one can do the, all of the experiments that are necessary to explain such a complex system. Um, but, you know, that said, we, we use uh, microfluidic chambers. Um, we try to get human lymphatic tissues whenever we can. Unfortunately, we have an almost infinite supply of human lymphatic tissues that we can get from ovarian cancer surgeries. Um, so, uh, you know, it, we, we, we just try and get what we can because it's, it's, it's really difficult with the lymphatic system. You cannot measure pressure flow or diameter in any human lymphatic vessel to any degree of accuracy that, um, that would be useful for, for informing our, the kinds of modeling we do. So we, we just have to rely on whatever is out there. Agreed. I I found your your bypass experiment really interesting. We were working in in uh, liver, and what we found doing uh, intravital imaging was that in fact a lot of the liver sinusoids are shut down a lot of the time, hmm. and that you actually see a lot of retrograde flow. You don't you don't expect to see blood going the wrong way in capillaries, but it happens a lot in the liver. And so I suspect that probably just the way some of the sort of truisms that people thought about, maybe perhaps the way you had flow in the lip nodes, uh, were because people had looked. Uh, we saw that it, when we went and looked at blood flow of the liver. And so I thought it was really fascinating to your, your comment about the possibility of having antigens shut down a bypass pathway. There seems to be bypass pathway in the liver, as it happened, uh, which uh, is important in certain situations. Uh, and so uh, there may be some, I mean, they're very different structurally, but there may be some analogies where you don't have active gating, you don't have pumps, uh, but you still could potentially be getting these kinds of flow control through more slightly more subtle or less obvious mechanisms. And that, that really could be, I, thought, I found that fascinating to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I, I, the liver is another fascinating warning for sure, and and is chock full of lymphatics as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't seen that paper. I, I, I'd be I'd like to read it. Okay, I'm gonna ask my John, John, John Yin. We've yes. got multiple Johns, so go ahead, please. Okay. Thanks. So this might be for both uh, Jimmy and Denise. Uh, um, perhaps overlapping Jimmy's interest in devices and Denise's on granulomas. Uh, I was wondering if either or both of you could comment on uh, challenges and opportunities for microfluidic or 3D uh, in vitro models uh, of granulomas. Go for it, Jimmy. I, I was going to ask you how they're constructed. So uh, I, I, w I obviously wouldn't know how to build one. So you go ahead. <laughs> well, there's actually um, a, a new push at the NIH for uh, 
for in vitro granulomas because there's a lot of you know cost i mean the monkeys cost twenty thousand each plus twenty thousand a year to house and you know a little different than mice so it's it's a very tough system if it wasn't for bill and melinda gates we, that we you know nih can't afford that um 300 colony of monkeys so so we, they need alternative approaches to these and and so one of them is this in vitro granuloma system but um you know it, it, and believe it or not, there were my, there were mouse bead models. There's other systems, but I, and there's been some microfluidic work done, but it's all in the very, very early stages. But I think it's a direction that NIH is pushing because they want, um, it's kind of a system that sits between the modeling and the actual, you know, it's like halfway in between. So I think we're going to start to see more data coming from that. The question is, you know, how different is what we see? It is so different in the mouse than in the primate. It's hard to even imagine what's going to happen when you even remove the in vivo piece and make it in, you know, in situ or, you know, what, what you're suggesting there. So I'm not really sure how much. And there's been some data saying we're going to learn a lot from it and other data saying it's not useful at all. So I think that I think it's still out on what's going to happen with that. Well, I'm very curious about that particular comment, the difference yeah. between the mouse and the primate. Yeah. Is there anything that one can build from a scaling perspective? you know, scaling of animal systems. So mouse, rat, primates, whales, I don't know. But uh, w so what are the key features that are different between the mouse beside, I don't know if it's dynamics or if the size or- uh, It's not know, size. It's definitely, yeah, it's not allometry. If it was allometry, we would be okay, but it's not allometry. M one of the main reasons is that the immune response is very different in mice than humans. So for example, in mice, uh, t t only Th2 type cells make IL-10, but in humans, a lot of t, t cell types make IL-10. So just that change alone is, now th there are some humanized mouse studies. There's something called the Kramnik mouse with a capital K by the Igor Kramnik. Um, it came up with this model where he was able to make a model that made granulomas that look like you know, hu human granul primate granulomas. But the issue is that mice don't even make granulomas. There's this infiltrate and stuff gets there, but it doesn't even form these beautiful structures, which defines TB, frankly. Um, the granuloma is the definition. I mean, tubercles comes from tuberculosis, which are calcified granulomas. So, um, so you know, there's something clearly different about the migration, and I don't think it's a size issue. And I'll tell you why. Because rabbits form glorious primate-like granulomas. Not much bigger than a rat or a mouse, but yet they're perfect. Why don't we use rabbit models? Because there are no immunological reagents for rabbit models. To, so you cannot use it as a scientific model for TB because no one's come up with, I mean, for the primate stuff, we use all human homologies. Um, so we're using human antibodies. We're using human probes, but there's nothing like that for the rabbit. So no one has developed that um, technology. So that's why we, but we use it because we can excise these granulomas and treat them with drugs and take beautiful pictures. And and so we're able to get some information, but no immunology um, from the rabbits. So could you comment on any differences in, in uh, structure and dynamics between non-human primates and humans then? Very, very similar. In fact, um, size is, that's an allometric situation there for sure um, with the humans and the, um, and the non-human primates. And as I said, you know, one has five drain, lung draining lymph nodes, one has seven. So there are some differences, but, um, but in terms of the overall disease and outcomes and, and, um, phenotypes that we see in disease there's many and the same bacteria you know infects both so that's important as well um even though it doesn't happen naturally in the in in rea in wild it happens in the lab um so yeah I great that, thank you yeah sure other other questions um I see John and Ruchira have their hands up anybody else before we go back to John and Ruchira since they've already asked a question or two Veronica, were you going to ask a question? Oh, sure. Uh, hi, Denise. Hi, hi, Veronica. Nice to see you. <laughs> I just saw that um, I, I'm wondering if you look at this question, uh, because there is another very common disease, sarcoidosis, that also uh, have this granulomas. granulomas. Mm -hmm. and is it like um, sarcoidosis is a light form of tuberculosis that is kind of appear and disappear in response? Because uh, like... 
Can you can you comment? Maybe you look at this. Sure. So it's really interesting because this granuloma thing is um, pretty unique to TB, okay? However, you, as you're suggesting, sarcoidosis um, caused by uh, a, um, a, a sort of a yeast parasite is very different, and yet it forms it. The difference is the granuloma that forms in tuberculosis is what we think of as Th1 driven. It's driven by infl inflammation of multiple um, cellular mediated immune um, inflammatory things. That The sarcoidosis granuloma is actually a Th2 driven granuloma. It looks very different and it, it's comprised of very different types of cells. And so that alone is so interesting. And I'll tell you something else. You know, um, the lungs are actually thought to be very Th2 dominant as in its resting state. So in other words, you wouldn't want the lungs Remember, you breathe in about 100,000 particles of crap all day long. Yeast, part, you know, um, pollen, you know, dust, I mean, all kinds of things all day. Viruses, you know, things like that. We would be, if your lungs were sort of default TH1, you'd be like getting pulmonary infections like all day long. But for the most part, our macrophages take that stuff up, chew it up, spit it out, and we're done. But so it takes a lot to turn the whole system of the lungs to a Th1 response in response to TB. It's like changing, taking a tank and turning it around, you know, where um, the sarcoidosis thing is a little bit different because the lungs are already default Th2. So actually sarcoidosis granulomas form much quicker and, and differently than the granuloma ones. So similar idea, very different mechanisms of... Um, Evolvement, but it's you know it's an open area. I wish people would do it because I think it'd be really fun to sort of use our stuff and study a different use our ideas and study a different disease. So I don't know if that answered your question, Bronco. Yeah, but, but do you know if um, actually sarcoidosis is more prevalent in the areas where tuberculosis is more prevalent, or no, there is no, no. sarcoidosis is different. It tend well, there is some overlap for sure, um, but it's typically rural and and farms and these kinds of situations where, and remember TB, you have to be crowded and lots of repeat exposure to to get it. So that's going to be more like not rural, more in cities, more but everybody's taking the same bus to the same coal mine every day. You know that kind of a thing. Um, that's pretty much the. The TB story. Th1 and Th2 separation is actually very interesting. Isn't that really cool? Yeah. yeah. And I, I will tell you that I, I read that about a decade ago when, when I learned about them. So I haven't followed that literature. So maybe I'll learn something. Maybe that they've evolved that literature more. So if there's anything there, I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Uh -huh, good luck. I guess I'm going to take the privilege of being at the, 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 the MC and ask one more question on the, the, the for Jimmy Moore which is, I really was very intrigued by your discussion of adjuvants. And talking to Veronica earlier today, we were discussing one of the key things, of course, is the duration of immune response. Back a year and a half ago, when this all mess started, I remember posting on Facebook, the only thing that matters about COVID is how long the immune response lasts. And you made the very interesting comment that depending on the presentation, of a particular antigen from a vaccine or potentially from the infection itself, you could excite very different kinds and types and durations of immune response. Can you give us any more insight into what your thinking is about ways forward? What would be interesting things to research to try to use the kinds of insights you have to understand the duration of immune response? Why do the same B cells churn out antibodies in one case for months and in other cases for a lifetime for example yeah I, these are these are great questions and i i, I again I, I i wish i knew the answers um you know i i i would guess that you know for something like covid where uh you know maybe the 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 antibody response is is transient perhaps we don't know but but maybe the t-cell receptor response response is what you're after then I think that's where we would come in and say, all right, well, this is the right adjuvant you need to induce that kind of immune response. The, the, the lymph node would need this time course of antigen delivery. Uh, and, uh, but we just don't have the information to do that. But I think that's the, that's the kind of thing we're heading for. So, you know, what, 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 what kind of response do you want? Okay, we got it. We, we know, you know, based <laughs> on this platform that we would build what sort of uh, 
delivery profile you 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 might want to give, and therefore pick the edge of an off the shelf or design one that that, that does that for you. So I just have a comment about that because, you know, the, I I live a little bit in the vaccine world for TB and. Everybody says one thing, if you're talking about vaccines and you don't use the word adjuvant, then you're not talking about vaccines. And, um, and I also wanna tell you something interesting, the most, the most um, antigenic thing known to humans is the cell wall of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And that's what Freud's adjuvant is. And yep. it's basically fish oil and MTB shell, cell wall, right? And when they do that little skin test, that's what it is, right? They, uh, they're putting basically Freud's adjuvant on your, under your arm. But I, I, you posed the question, Jimmy, about like, what's the trigger? And I really think, and we've thought about this for a while with adjuvants, that the point of the adjuvant is to trigger the innate immune response because it's the innate immune response that triggers adaptive immunity. And so you get in there, you still, so I agree with you. It doesn't trigger adaptive immunity at all. I think what it does is trigger the innate immune response, which says, aha, we better turn on the adaptive immune response. And so maybe that, maybe it's an indirect thing. And so if there's somebody could that do that really early modeling where you're getting compliment, you're getting, you know, TLR engagement, those sorts of things, I think that might be, um, a key for that, but I think it's going to require somebody to really think about that. You know, um, I also wanted to ask you a question. So in the modeling that we did, and this was mice study, so it'd be relevant with Mark Miller on lymph nodes. Um, you know, it's very interesting because dendritic cells leave the site of infection and they go to the lymph nodes. And of course they stimulate T cells and T cells leave and go to, you know, through the efferent lymphatics and they go back to the site of infection. Dendritic cells never leave. We never, if we, we stay in the efferent lymphatics and we never see dendritic cells ever leaving. And I wonder how could it be that you could be selective who gets to go and who doesn't. And I get the whole lymphadenopathy mm -hmm. thing is happening, but isn't that interesting? So I don't know what you think about that. Um, yeah, well, you know, it could be that their job is just to deliver the information. And once they're done, they, um, you know, they, they, they probably just die. Um, but, but, you know, T cell, uh, they, 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 you know, there's, there's the S1P receptor on T cells that, that guides them out. Um, I think there's also a role for the high endothelial venules in, in lymph nodes for T cell delivery into the, uh, into the bloodstream. I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure that's, that's been looked at as heavily as it should be, because I, I think that's probably another route that T cells use to get out. Of, of but if them. there's flow, it's like, I feel like the DCs are hanging on and the T cells are going by them. You know, oh, yeah. I had this image in my head of, you know, if there's flow pushing you out, you know, how do you keep from going? I, I get it that the T cells upregulate, you know, vascularization, you know, trans, you know, endothelial vascular to get out, but I don't get how the other guys don't get washed out. But anyway, I find that that, that has always been very intriguing to me that the D cells, uh, the nitrogenic cells don't leave. So. Yeah. Um, also, I don't understand what flow resistance is. I, I just, I mean, I get what it is. I, I know what it is, but I don't understand what it, do, it does in the lymph node or why it's there. I'm, I'm a little confused about that. Yeah. So, you know, keep in mind each lymphatic vessel can only generate a little bit of pressure and it's got to, it's got to use that pressure to push flow all the way through the lymph node, which is like a, a big sponge in the way. So it's a, it's a big resistance to flow. And, um, you know, so, so what, again, what we've shown is that under normal conditions, when you, you know, if you're not responding to anything, most of the flow will go around the low resistance pathway just to keep the fluid moving and stop you from getting edema in normal mm -hmm. conditions. And only 10% goes into the, where the B cells and the T cells are. So that's sort of, you know, 10% needs to be smelled for, you know, potentially bad things happening. But, uh, but then, you know, that gets tripled with the with the shutdown of the uh, of the low resistance pathway i see i see yeah and then my last thing is you know tim padera and lance munn do work on lymphatic transport and i'm wondering like what are they doing that's different than what you are is there overlap or are you guys asking different questions because i'm i saw them give a talk last year and you know in the systems biology stuff and i'm trying to figure out like there seems yeah, to be they do great work it's uh, i think what we do is a bit more uh physiology oriented and um you know, I, 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 what they've done, I, and Tim's paper that came out in Science in 2018 on uh, yeah. the, the static cells going into the high endothelial venues is just fascinating stuff. It's really, uh, really cool stuff. So, um, you know, they're certainly more concerned with cancer 
um, than, than we are. But yeah, we overlap a lot. We, uh, we have beers at uh, lymphatic conferences and, uh, and enjoy each other's work for sure. Okay. Thank you. It was an awesome talk. Right. I, I, sorry, I know we're out of time. But I just wanted to add, I found a really cool paper recently on the differences between T cell responses in mice and men. Uh, and this paper <laughs> in the chat is, um, shows there are orders of magnitude differences in the mouse system versus the human system in CAR T cell therapy, therapy is what this one's about, but it's, it's a really cool paper. Great modeling. So I put that in. Well, I hate to cut the conversation off. <laughs> in principle, is there one last question before we break? It's very late in London, so we don't want to keep our speaker. This is John. As, as a community of multi-scale modelers that the working group is, is made up of, if, if we could have two things that would best serve the community in the next two years, and, and with the two presenters, you know, the kind of work you're doing, what would be the two things that would be the most helpful to you guys that, you know, the barrier that has to be broken or whatever to make what you're doing like more useful sooner. You want to answer first, Jimmy? Or you <laughs> yeah, got an answer ready, go for it, I'll, I'll think. Um, well, I think computing power, you know, I have to beg, borrow and steal computing power. And, you know, we get stuff on Exceed and we get stuff on NERSC and, you know, I mean, our models take a lot to run. So for us, we would like unlimited access to, to you know, simulation com power. And then number two, you know, I need more. The thing is, I can build my models, but I, I don't. I can't spend time making beautiful GUIs and dashboards that I could share and let people play with and use. Because NIH is not giving me money for that. They're giving me money for, um, you know, for to answer a specific question. But I can't actually spend time to make everything look all pretty and nice, and so I can share my models and usable and you know, translatable and things like that. So obviously, Jakob um, disagrees with me, so he can answer that question. I'm going to take executive privilege and give Jimmy Moore the chance to discuss what he thinks the most important thing is, and we'll let him close out the meeting. Uh, well, I, that's a great honor. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm constantly frustrated by, well, I mean, we're all frustrated when our research proposals get turned down. I think, I think the, the sort of lack of appreciation for uh, systems biology for you know, the chemical engineering aspects of lymph node function, I, it just, it's just not appreciated by a large swath of the biological community. I, I think that's the, what, the one thing I would wish for is better communication amongst the sciences and, and a better uh, appreciation for what other points of view can bring to a problem so complex as what goes on inside a lymph node. Okay, well, I want, to thank, <laughs> thank, I want to thank our speakers again. Uh, we definitely need you to come back and talk more and have more discussion. I, I appreciate so much people staying on uh, and being willing to join in in the discussion pit. And with that, I'm afraid uh, we have to close the meeting. Uh, and. Uh, it, we will just have to say that we will will have you back. Thank you again. This was a wonderful discussion and it was wonderful talks. Really, thank, thank you. you all. It was thank a lot you. of fun. Bye, thank everybody. You. We'll look Goodbye. forward to receiving the chat list because there were lots of references popped up in there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, a lot of reading to do before next week. Oh, buddy. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Bye. And apologies to those who didn't get to ask all of their questions.